Now, if you, like me, think that unchecked AI is going to take over the world and leave humanity behind, you're not alone. 42% of all CEOs have found, or rather have said, that AI could destroy humanity in just five to 10 years. And this was at a Yale CEO summit that was held in June this year. Today, I'll be talking about the playful methods that we put, trying to put the human back into artificial intelligence. And more importantly, trying to make sure that AI doesn't leave humanity behind. There are two things that I need to confess right off the bat. The first is that I'm an avid gamer. Surprise. The second, and maybe worse, is that I work in artificial intelligence. So if you've done your time in artificial intelligence, you know that AI needs a whole bunch of human guidance to not go completely off the rails. In fact, in 2018, Reuters reported that Amazon had to scrap an AI recruitment tool as it was trained on past data. And this past data overwhelmingly favored male humans. The cause was found to be a lack of human oversight to correct the bias in this past historical human training data. Now, up to 80% of any artificial intelligence project is in preparing this data or getting this data back and then fine tuning it and putting it back in again. 100% of that is absolutely mind numbing. Trust me, I've been there. It's boring. It's drawing boxes on cars. It's deciding whether or not an inane tweet is positive or negative. It's classifying objects into categories. So exciting, right? No, none of that is very fun at all. A few years back, the company that I was with had to annotate thousands of documents of data for very specific words. This was for a very large public sector project. And the way that you would see all of this is something like this. Really, really complex, really boring in nature. This project broke us. We tried doing it ourselves, but this would have taken us literal years to do. We tried to hire part-timers to do this, but they wound up falling asleep on the job. We had to fire them. We tried asking our CEO back then to do it. We ourselves almost got fired. So my co-founder, Jin, and I started thinking to ourselves, what if there was a way to actually make this entire boring data annotation thing somewhat easy and convenient to do? What if there was a way, and dare I say it, to make this AI stuff fun? What if there was a way for us to put the human back into the loop while doing so? So we were talking. We were on the, the train, the MRT. Right? And we're talking to ourselves, we're racking our brains, thinking about whether or not this could actually happen. And then we were just looking down this whole time, but then we looked up. We looked at everyone around the train, and we saw something that I think everyone sees on a daily basis. People were watching videos on their phones, perhaps YouTube. People were playing to themselves and smiling to themselves, swiping on this app called Tinder, of course. And some were, of course, playing Candy Crush, Pokemon Go, and what have you, some other game on your phone. And this, to us, was a light bulb moment. We would take this data annotation thing, this really boring thing, and turn it into a game, borrowing mechanics from all of our favorite applications. We developed our very first prototype really early on with the idea that binary classification, which is taking something and putting it into one of two categories could essentially be broken down into a really simple mechanic, the left, right, swipe. So what would happen is that we would show you an image, and then you would classify it into one of two categories by swiping left or swiping right. It sounds really familiar to a lot of you. I can see it on your faces, right? And we like to say that this was inspired by Tinder, but in reality, it was actually inspired by this game that I was playing at the time called Reigns, which was a text-based game that used the left-right swipe mechanic to tell a really compelling story. So what we did was that we took this really simple concept of user-friendly user interfaces and then expanded it across our entire platform. Then we set it loose across the world with our very first few data sets. Immediately, we learned four lessons and then after that, we also picked up one fifth lesson that we're still learning from today. The first lesson is that using game mechanics is actually really great 
for making your platform really intuitive to use. By mimicking the user interfaces of many of our favorite games, we didn't need to teach our users how to use the applications. What we did was that we put the buttons in the places that were already familiar to them, and this worked. In our first user test, we told them to just pick up a task and start using the application. Quickly, we saw that our users would jump right in, they would start drawing boxes, they would start swipe, swiping left and right, and this was how they were able to do image segmentation, which is a very complex task within data annotation. Second, it doesn't need to look like a game in order to feel like a game. Let me show you some of our first few screens. Our initial user interface was heavily influenced by, you might guess it, Candy Crush. When we rolled this out, we thought it was a winner. Colorful interfaces, blobby fun buttons. You like Candy Crush? You like this, right? Wrong. The complaints started coming in, that the text was too hard to read, that the colors were too colorful, too colorful, and distracting, and that some people even told us it was straight up ugly, and that was hurtful. So we took that feedback, and then we transformed the user interface into something cleaner, keeping the same mechanics in place. It doesn't necessarily look like a game, right? But it's a lot cleaner, and it's a lot more fun to us as well. The user feedback was immensely positive. The third lesson we learned is that fun is subjective. I mean, to you and me, of course, everyone here, this seems like common sense but we were actually still surprised by what our users considered fun in really unexpected ways. Case in point, for a speech recognition project that we were doing, we needed to collect audio clips of people saying different things, command words like up, down, left, right, stop, go. One of the requirements for this task was pretty restrictive. The clip itself needed to be less than two seconds long, and you couldn't hold the record button for longer than that. You also needed to make sure that you started speaking half a second after you hit record, which explains the wait two bars up there. Surprisingly, when we spoke to one of our users, they told us that they found this restriction to be a fun challenge. They liked trying to get it to two seconds. They liked trying to wait two bars in order to say the word. Something that we thought was super annoying could actually be reframed as a challenge or an achievement rather than a plain or boring restriction. The fourth thing that we learned is that games are in fact a double-edged sword when it comes to performing serious tasks. We have put in this mechanic, coins, where people could earn in-game currency and then after that exchange them for real-world rewards. As you can probably tell, we quickly ran into a problem. Because it's a game-like interface, and because it's got real-world rewards, some users started trying to game the system by swiping randomly, hoping that we would give them coins for effectively useless data. Quality control became a serious issue since we had real AI projects that we needed to deliver real data sets for. Also, like in a game, the assumption was that if you complete 50% of the task accurately, you will get 50% of the coins. This couldn't work for us because in an AI data set, 50% of the data being accurate means that your entire data set is useless. So we changed the rules of the game, making it such that our users would only receive coins if their accuracies were above 80%. And in fact, what we did was that we scaled up the rewards as well, so that as close as you got to 100% accuracy, you would get more coins as well. These game mechanics helped us to change the way that our tigers behaved, from valuing speed over everything else to valuing accuracy over speed, which was exactly where we needed them to be. So on to the fifth lesson that we picked up. Fifth, simplification increases accessibility, and accessibility allows more of society to participate. One incredible aspect of this approach to taking data annotation in this new direction was that this opened the doors to many more segments of the community that would not otherwise have been able to participate in this newfangled AI economy. We have made it a goal really early on to impact underserved communities, and gamifying this aspect of annotation gave us this golden opportunity to do just that. Traditional annotation tools were actually really confusing, complex, 
and most importantly, they needed a desktop or a laptop to use. By being able to condense this and simplifying it into a game-like interface, we managed to get people with disabilities, or PWDs, to use this as a secondary source of income, where it was difficult for them to do before. We also wanted to take this one step further, to truly humanize AI by making it benefit the community while it was being created. So we got help. We started working with social service organizations, nonprofits, charities. These were the experts. They taught us that while we're on the right path, there's still so much for us to do in order to make this data annotation game that we created really suitable for persons with disabilities. Things like making it seamless for somebody to sign in and use the application, even if they had disabilities, or even disability-focused gamification training modules, and even specialized communication tools that would support people with disabilities. Our work with, with people with disabilities has continued to be both truly inspiring and humbling. This brings everything together. My team and I set out to make the boring parts of artificial intelligence fun so that humans like you and me would be willing to do these really boring things and even benefit from it. We wound up making it our mission to go one step even beyond that, to build a future where game mechanics will make this future AI economy accessible to all. That's because in the end, we believe that humanity still has a part to play in making sure that AI serves the greater good. And to me, the more of humanity we involve in doing that, maybe with some clever game mechanics along the way, the better we are for it. Thank you for exploring my two favorite topics with me, and may you find a way to work AI and gaming into your everyday life. <laughs>